So I think that I have read every post um, in all my classes, but two posts in one class. So I think I'm caught up. So if you think you handed something in and it hasn't come back with either comments or comments and a grade, you should let me know. Um, there are some people behind. And if you hand in more than two weeks late, as I said, don't send me a separate email because it just drives me nuts trying to keep track. Just put it right at the beginning of the post or no, over on the comments section. Just put why it's late. I tend to be generous, especially with AUW students. But I also know that Lion is, I just found out, <laughs> just found out the cause related to um, what happened. And so, yeah, okay. So Lion students, um, now I understand better what's going on at Lion. So anyway, um, I think that because I teach this kind of reflective consciousness, it does require time and it does require letting go of constant stress and assignments and all that. So if you truly think that in order to do a good job, you just need to take another day or something, I don't mind if you write that down. On the other hand, I might knock off a couple points, not because I didn't want you to do it, but because I can't reward it or I can't ignore it because then it'll get taken advantage of. But if you really think you could do a better job by waiting a day or whatever, a day or two, go ahead. Um, again, they're due on Thursdays or Fridays. And technically, if they get in after a certain hour on Friday, then I, I can grade it down. But if you just give me, I needed one more day, um, that's fine. Um, I think you understand. I think students understand, first of all, why in my discipline I would allow that, not because I'm not rigorous or whatever, but on the other hand, students would understand how that can get taken advantage of. And it has been in the past. So, so I'm just trying to find this middle ground between being too lenient and not lenient enough, right? Um, the mean between extremes. So this is what we're doing today. I gave you the assignment, the virtue of an educated citizen or educated voter, whatever that said. It is about American history, but I think I, I hope AUW students can take note of it in the sense that developing countries want to move in that direction of getting citizens engaged, right? Developing countries, many of them do have citizens voting and that's supposed to be this wonderful um, indication that now they're democratic. But, you know, my students have said multiple times that underneath that it's not really democratic. Well, the thing is, our, my students who say that are educated, like they know what's going on. <laughs> they know that people disappear if they speak out. So, um, and then a lot of students at both schools understand what happens when voters are not educated, I think, because you are the best and the brightest, right? You are Plato's audience, Aristotle's audience, um, liberal arts college. Students are supposed to be the ones that got that more elite education, but you can see that ever since America's founding, the point of that education was to use it to, to, to develop a whole educated citizenry. It was not 
to just get that education and then join the aristocratic class and become a lawyer, doctor, privileged person, right? You're supposed to take that education, understand you're not going to have a democracy unless the educated spread education in some way uh, to the underserved, because there has to be a basic core of educated citizens who don't get manipulated by power hungry people that tell them what they want to hear and then get elected and then take over and either overtly or covertly uh, exercise power in a very undemocratic way. So we talked about that with Socrates, remember, supposedly he lived in a democracy and he was going out there in the marketplace asking the privileged, okay, what is justice? You're a political leader. So he was asking for transparency and then follow-up questions, accountability. And so, but you have to be an educated, you have to have a certain level of citizen consciousness to understand that it's important how the people use authority and that it's your responsibility to try and seek these people out, find ways to make them accountable and transparent about what they do. So I hope that the students at co uh, countries other than the US can figure out why I assigned this and what they can learn from it. And I'm also hoping that they brought comments that will be really interesting to the other students. Um, so I would like to, okay, so I'll just go through the outline of the article for a minute. And um, if you didn't come with your three comments, jot down something right now. But I assume that you brought your comments and you know what you want to talk about. So that's the key is that I don't want to tell you what you want to talk about. Each of you really has insights that never even occurred to me, right? Cause I am from such a different situation. So all of us learn a lot from each other especially when it comes to things like this. So, um, let me get this. All right, the virtue of an educated voter. Uh, um, so think about this, whether all of you agree to this, that in order to have a republic, in order to have a society governed by citizens who take turns ruling and being ruled, who elect their representatives and whose representatives are accountable to the will of the people, you need broad-based education. The citizens have to know what the credentials are of the people who are running for office. What, it amazes me that I ask my students, well, what do uh, political leaders do? Like what sort of background experience would you want? Like you're hiring somebody for a job what should they have already done as preparation for doing this job? And I, it's shocking to me how few students have thought about it, uh, how they really don't think about that. And then they vote for people who have none of the experience or credentials necessary. You would never hire somebody with this CV to do this job. So yes, all right, that's a problem. Anyway. And the next question is who pays for it? So this is um, about in the US, these arguments about who pays for it. Um, in the developing countries, I, I hope that, that you all understand that the debate is similar and different. I'm not quite sure how the debate in each country plays out. So, um, so I think, I mean, I would love to be a fly on the wall. So if I come into your group, try to ignore me, all right? Um, I, 
I probably won't because every time I do, I tend to disrupt things. But um, I hope, you know, you have a lot to say because I really think there could be a lot of variety on this. Is education perceived as a social benefit or an individual achievement? Um, all right, so I think this threat to a republic is true in developing countries. And um, I think more so than, I don't know what it has been in the US, although right now it's a little iffy. Um, so in Europe, the founders of the US just came from Europe where there were privileged a monarchy and aristocracy. There was one class of people that had it all and inherited wealth and power. So the US wanted a government based on laws, not on people. So representatives elected by the people would make laws that were in the interest of everyone. So the art of statecraft is the art of weaving people together and creating a strong and stable middle class. And so the US was divided. Um, and the founders knew they have to find a way to weave these people together. All right, you need a strong national identity. And this was, I mean, when I read Panchasila, I thought about this. So Untari is here. I hope she, she, you know, that's a connection. Um, the, the thing you wanna watch out for is power hungry people that appeal to class resentments, right? Um, vote for me because those other people are just rich and they don't care about your interests. Um, and I'll take over and I'll, I'll redistribute wealth. That's one kind of demagogue or a military despot. Okay, so that isn't likely in our country. The military is driven by the wealthy in our country, but in other countries, it is always an issue because there's a centralization of power in the military. Um, empire, Authoritarian governments thrive on an uneducated populace. Now there's the necessity for, um, so someone should turn off their mic, whatever. So this is what I want you to think about, the capacity to transcend your diverse. Okay, so the microphone. Who is it? Traboni. Turn off your mic. Shraboni? Shraboni, Shraboni. Uh, professor, you can mute her. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, thanks. Um, okay, so this is, this is the main theme of the next couple weeks. Practical wisdom, thinking like a citizen. You have to be able to transcend your different self-interest and learn how to cultivate an, a desire for and an understanding of the common good, okay? If everyone pursues private inter, uh, interest, the society will become unstable and a powerful person will take over. So this is the only way to preserve a free and open society. Um, you need education to know the backgrounds of the candidates. This is what Socrates was worried about. Um, okay, Aristotle said to keep a society stable, the educational system has to support the constitution. If you have a monarchy, make sure the family of the monarch rules for the sake of the ruled is taught the importance of the middle class. If you have an aristocracy, make sure they learn. You have to use their authority to create a middle class. In a democracy, you have to have broad-based education and the people have to be uh, self-controlled, generous. They have to have personal virtues. 
so that they'll be able to make good judgments about which things, what decisions, what laws would promote a strong and stable middle class. Um, in the US, we complain that it's expensive. Um, that has been a problem way since the beginning. Uh, Jefferson wanted to tax the rich uh, to educate the poor for the public good. Um, but there was a problem. All anybody cared about was getting rich. And so this has been a problem in the US. Uh, but Aristotle said, Aristotle and Plato, the particular vice that undermines a free and open society, the most uh, threatening vice is greed. Because if you're greedy and all you want is money and you have a free and open society, you will use your freedom to get richer and richer. And that'll be at the expense of others and that'll shrink the middle class. Then there'll be class resentments and then if an instability and eventually a strong, strong man will come and take over in the name of bringing back law and order. So um, greed is bad. It's the political evil. Um, but how do you pay for taxes for education? Um, every other interest comes and lobbies and gives money to political campaigns. Uh, but the education lobby, some of them, I mean, that has money too. Um, it just depends upon how much, but everybody in my country is trying to pay for political campaigns and then get paid back by the legislators making laws in their interest, not necessarily in the society's interest. Um, okay. The, okay, here, this is important because the kind of education they wanted included Greek and Latin. So that's a very elitist education. Why would they want these people out in the frontier of the US reading Plato and Aristotle and Greek tragedy and Cicero and Seneca and all this stuff? Well, I think that after I've taught you about these things, you would understand why, because it, it's the foundation for um, what setting up a democratic society, ruling for the sake of the ruled, the important lesson that the elite must develop the practical wisdom necessary to maintain a strong middle class. Okay, in my country, he gives some data about what went on. Um, and I don't know if people from other countries know about the North and the South in the US is still pretty divided. Um, but the philosophy change, the philosophy of education, and that's, that's where the philosopher comes in is that the philosophy underlying the policies really matters. So it went from being a social good to being a, an economic good. So now, if, you're, if you work hard, the theory is you work hard, get a good job, save money, send your kid to college. Nobody should you know, have to pay charity to send somebody else's kid to college. So college is, shows that your parents were successful and cared about you or that you um, uh, can work hard and pay your own way to college. Um, and that now we have all this student debt because it's not, it's not working very well. Um, but you can tell that the, the Greek view is knowledge for its own sake and that it's um and for the sake of preserving democracy do you, you remember hopefully with athens right the the public came to the marketplace they found out about what's going on in the assembly and in the courts and they went over and talked about it and then you go to the tragedy and everybody's talking about which characters 
they like and not. And it's really learning how to exercise power to preserve a middle class. Um, so it has social benefits, but now in America, there's um, a demonization of government as authoritarian. And so government providing education is being demonized as brainwashing, immoral and anti-democratic. Um, funding is reduced in the poor neighborhoods. It sets up social Darwinism basically. Um, the rich want their kids to get educated and so they, they don't wanna pay for education of the poor. Um, all right, so then we go through Athenian institutions. Is public education anti-democratic? Okay, so you need to think about, think about the different philosophies. People really do have different philosophies. Since 2007, there's been cutting funding for schools. Um, the, the social costs are uh, over the long haul, it's economic growth. Like how are we gonna, how are all of us, everybody in this room, how's your country gonna compete with China, right? China educates their kids. Um, and they limit their population and they're really focused on moving forward based on education. So what are we gonna do if we don't educate our citizens? Um, all right, let's see. What are our common beliefs? So again, all of you in each of your countries, I think you have to ask what are our common beliefs? And um, I disagree with this guy. I think that it isn't Protestant Christianity. I think it's the classical virtues. So I, he, it's odd to me that he doesn't bring that in at this point. And he just says it's devolved into relativism. Uh, and we have to recover the concept of virtue classically defined. Well, who said we lost it? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so then I list Aristotle's virtues and we'll go over that later. So right now, I just want you to think about what you brought that you wanted to talk about. And then if anything, you know, I brought up sort of triggers some reaction that can add to what you want to talk about. So I'm going to create a couple breakout groups and I would want all of you to assign someone to be the leader who keeps the conversation going, who makes sure everybody talks and who will report back. And ideally, I would like it to be someone who's never done it before be because this is just part of liberal arts education is that you learn how to lead in discussions, right? Uh, oral communication and leadership skills. So take it seriously, try to develop a high quality of conversation. If you're confused about something, um, you can come, I'll be here, right? And um, try not to let the conversation devolve into something, just into changing the subject. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so Samantha, okay, that has three. That has two. Okay. Oh, sorry, didn't open the rooms. Um, okay, Let me make sure. Here, Thomas. Kiss here. It's so hot that I have so few. Um, what's that worst? What's that?
What's going on right now? Okay. Oops, Shanima. Hello, uh, Shraboni. Let's see. Okay. How are you? Wait, I think I'll move you. Um, Shamima, I'm going to move you to number one. Okay. Um, okay, so then one. Okay. Yeah. What was here? Disconnected.
Okay, so um, I think we only have five students from AUW. Anyway, so I did have the, the groups turned out to be different sizes. So the bigger one might have not finished and the smaller one finished early. So just come right into the main room as soon as you're done so we can move on. And I will make the groups more equitable and I'll switch out a few members of one to the other one. Okay, so the next step is to go back and look at Aristotle's list of virtues, because that's going to be kind of the foundation for the class. Because I want you to understand that when you get involved in debates about political things, that there are patterns, there are types of issues that are politically that are about the political sphere. And then there's types of issues that start out in the personal sphere, and then there's the connection between them. And so when a student you know, says to me, well, I don't follow politics very much. What? Um, I am Yeah, okay. All right. I caught on, you guys. I figured out how to mute somebody. Um, but when students say that to me, I'm really amazed because they don't, they didn't used to think that politics affected their life, and it does. So in the in the Greek view, there's really not much uh, of a break. In America, we have a ideology, we have a belief system that tries to minimize government and focus on individual achievement, as the last article said. But um, the Greek view is that we're very interdependent and we absolutely need each other uh, for everything. And those needs are getting even greater right now. So what I want to do first is emphasize the relationship between what people will perceive as personal issues and political issues. And so um, right now, of course, the COVID situation, people th th <coughs> some people think it should be a personal choice, uh, whether to get the vaccine, whether to get tested. And some people think it's a political choice. It has, it has implications for public health public safety, public education, all this sort of stuff. So we are having in our country a whole lot of debates about that. In your country, you can bring up. So take note if you want to bring that up in your groups. Do people do? Uh, professor, sorry to interrupt. So uh, when you said that, when you talked about uh, uh, it's the uh, choice of people whether they are willing to take vaccine or not. So uh, I had a quick query about vaccination in USA because uh, I heard news uh, about USA where it says that uh, uh, the government is uh, giving some sort of amount to the citizens in order to vaccine, in order to get vaccinated, is it true? Like, if someone gets vaccinated, then they are uh, provided with uh, some amount of money as a reward or something like that. Actually, it's certain states. So the governors of various states are offering um, some of them money, some of them tickets to mm -hmm. some sort of event. So they're. But that's, I don't, that's not at the federal level, at least at this point, not that I last heard. Um, so is it, so is it, uh, is it done for motivating citizens to get vaccinated or what? Well, it depends, you know, the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. there's a different, so, I mean, the U.S. is very fractured. It has 50 states and they have very different uh, policies and cultures. So um, anyway, so you can you can talk about that in your in your breakout groups also. Um, Thank you, Professor. Okay, so 
So number one is the COVID situation. How do you interpret that in terms of individual rights and freedoms versus public um, health, public safety, public education, kids can't go to school because you know there's too many COVID or they couldn't last year. It prevented students from being in school um, anyway. All of that, you can talk about that. Here is another, uh, some quotes from students before COVID, and it was about 9-11. And I want you to think about, if, you, if you're not in the USA in particular, if you can think of similar examples, or if you are in the USA, again, if you can think of similar examples. But this is, um, this is from some of the papers. If you want to write your paper on the connection between, this is stress and depression and, and political life. So that's what these uh, students were writing about. In America today, we live in the shadow of 9-11. Esther Sternberg says, but we also live in a fearful world which for Americans is a relatively new thing. It always used to be over there. Since 9-11, it's come here, unquote. So she's quoting, she's doing what she's supposed to do in her paper. This fear has seeped into the lives of every American. My grandmother doesn't leave her home without her pistol because she doesn't want to become a victim. She was diagnosed with panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder about five years ago. Um, I personally become very anxious when I'm in public places because of the terrorist acts that have occurred recently. Um, so I, I can ask the rest of you or, you know, the U.S. In the U.S., even though you have, you're diagnosed with panic disorder and generalized, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, you could buy a gun, right? Um, you could buy a lot of guns if you want to. And I don't know if the students from elsewhere know that. And I don't know if in their countries, they're allowed to buy guns. She says, my cousin is eight years old. She's so scared to go to the movies because she heard her parents talk about a massacre in a movie theater, all right? Okay, so here's another one. The connection between our current political climate and stress and depression is outstanding. If one happens to be in a minority group, such as a Muslim or a member of the LGBTQ community, if you're part of a group that's seen as evil within politics, that will have a toll on your stress levels and your emotional state. Um, and then she quotes from uh, a newspaper article. He says, following the November 15th Paris terror attacks, one of the candidates for the presidential nomination of 2016 compared Muslims to rabid dogs and suggested if there's a rabid dog running around in your neighborhood, you're probably not going to assume something good about that dog. So this person was actually African-American and uh, was running for president. Um, my grandmother goes to the farmer's market. Um, one day, a woman wearing a head covering walked by our booth. My grandmother said, how much you want to bet she's about to pull a gun out and shoot us all? Um, and her opinion on Muslims has not gotten any better. I mean, the sad part of it is she's never met a Muslim, but I don't think she's ever met a Muslim, right? Here's another one. While driving in the car with some of my family, my grandfather once said, you know, if Hitler had won, we wouldn't be having to deal with all these Muslims and homosexuals. Everybody else laughed and agreed. And so her point here is that it's causing her a lot of stress, right? She, this stresses her out and it stresses out a lot of people. <laughs> uh, I can, she says, I can definitely say 
about a quarter to a half the people I know openly claim Christianity is superior and all others are wrong and inherently evil. So of course they want other religions to be eradicated. Um, and so her conclusion is, whether one believes it or not, politics plays a large role in society, all the way down to the individual level. Um, if a quarter to a half of the people around you are open about their hatred of you, and you know that that many people are open about it, you become fearful, fear um, affects everything you do. The fear becomes stress. The mixture of fear and stress will cause depression. So um, it's a breeding ground of malicious sentiments against minorities. Uh, being part of a hated group will cause you fear and stress and will eventually lead you to depression. So that's just another way to look at it. And those, and so everybody can take note, see if there's anything from that they would want to talk about in their groups. And then I want to go through the list of Aristotle's political virtues, right? So we have the personal virtues. So because it's a list, you can sort of see how they're all interconnected. And hopefully you can see how we talk about a lot of this stuff. But I mean, my job is just to show you that there's patterns in the things we talk about. There's different types of things that we naturally talk about because they're part of our lives. Now, everybody knows eating, drinking, sex, right? We know about that. We know to some extent about fear, but, you know, we, we don't always know how much a fear of loss of status is driving people's behavior. Sometimes people themselves don't even know that that's what's driving them. But you can still say that in general, this does drive people. Um, Generosity is always an issue we debate about. And so in terms of funding for public education, what about taxing? Should people be forced to pay by the government so that everyone can get a good education? Or should people just give to charity, you know, choose, have the freedom to choose? Um, what about anger? How much does that affect political life? So right now in the U.S., we have a lot of polarization. What is that? That's anger, <laughs> right? Yeah, people get angry and that makes them incapable of thinking straight about things that they really need to think straight about. Ambition. Okay, so if your ambition is simply to get rich, um, Aristotle, Plato, the founding fathers will say, you're going to lose your democracy. Um, because you have to understand that centralized wealth creates instability, which then the people at the bottom are looking for a strong man to take care of them and bring back law and order. And then that person will take over and you won't have free speech, free scientific inquiry, free artistic expression, citizen engagement. Um, knowing how to honor citizens that actually promote that in their personal lives, your friendships. Okay, then the political virtues specifically, the pleasure that comes from making a profit. That's the economic sector. And that's what Aristotle says, when that becomes corrupted and all people care about is money, and the same with the founders, then you're going to start... Uh, losing your democracy. The art of legislation. So, okay. So what I want each of you to do is to write down an example in your country of what you think um, is a good law or a bad law in about related to economics, business law that you think is good or bad because it promotes, it doesn't it undermines the middle class, right? So for Aristotle, statecraft, knowing how to make good laws is knowing how to weave together the rich and poor and create a middle class. So try to create it, uh, give an example from your country of a 
business law, a law regulating business in some way that is harmful or helpful. So you can do two, but at least do one to creating a middle class. Then you want to, um, okay, so just more generally, try to think of a law that you think promotes democracy or undermines democracy. You can also talk about a person, like is there a certain political leader in your country that you think is particularly good about promoting a middle class or is particularly hip hypocritical? They say they care and they don't. So um, think of one in your country, distributing wealth, right? How to allocate resources so that people will develop their capabilities to the highest degree, talents are recognized. So this isn't based on complete equality. Not everybody should get a, all the money necessary to get a PhD because not everybody has that natural ability. Um, so you have to distribute it in a way that enables each person to develop their capabilities and their interests. Um, now think of a law like taxing for education. Think of a law that you think uh, distributes wealth, but is a bad law because it doesn't promote a middle class. And it was motivated by what, who passed it and why? What was the real motive? Or a good law, right, in your country that really is um, trying to, excuse me, create a middle class. Um, punishing criminals, right? So there are two philosophies for punishing criminals. One of them is just punitive. You did something bad, I'm going to lock you up and throw away the key or lock you up and ignore you. And then you get your sentence and you sent, you get sent back out. No job skills, no alternative. You know, you go right back to the old neighborhood. You commit another crime, you get back in, in prison. That's one way. And it's all your fault because you're bad. Okay. The other way is rehabilitation. Okay. You made a mistake. You're going to come, we're going to ask you to, to do this work, develop this skill, come out of your prison with a employable skill, find a different neighborhood to go into, get connected with a job, um, and get your life back on track. That's the other way to approach uh, punishment, the criminal justice system. So you can think of laws that are good laws or bad laws. Um, for example, one of my students wrote about these programs where you educate prisoners. So the state will pay money for teachers to come in and educate uh, prisoners. And um, yeah, I uh, someday when I, get older and I don't teach at these other two schools, I really am, I want to at least inquire about teaching at there's a all women's prison in Minnesota. And I, I really would like to do that. But anyway, so it costs $1,400 or something per um, to do this, to have this class. On the other hand, every one prisoner who ends up coming back uh, for one year, it costs $14,000 to have them in jail or prison. And the, the prisoners who go to school, get a GED, a high school equivalent degree, um, are much less likely to be repeat offenders. So the higher a degree they get, the less they repeat. And the ones who get any degrees repeat a lot less than the ones who don't. So this is a good investment, right? The amount you pay versus the amount you save long-term is amazing. 
But if all you think is that the criminal system is, is, should not be anything other than punishment, then, of course, you aren't even going to do it because the principle of the thing is that they get punished. I'm not going to give them an education because they committed a crime. So, so the idea there is I just want them to get out and become good tax-paying citizens. You know, I'm not going to be self-righteous about this. But people disagree. And so try to think of examples in your country of good ways to deal with the criminals, people who've been accused of breaking the laws, and bad ways. Then the other uh, quality is be a judge or a jury. So what happens do the judges apply the laws fairly and equitably? So when it comes to distrib distrib distribution of wealth, people have different needs. But when it comes to punishing wrongs, anybody who murders somebody should go to prison if they're poor or rich or one ethnicity or the other ethnicity or one gender or another. It ought to be equal. And then, if, and then the judges are the ones who apply the laws or the juries. So this is a case with Socrates where Socrates thought the legal system was okay, um, but the particular judgment of the jury was wrong. Their judgment was corrupted. So think of examples in your countries. I know when I was in Indonesia, there were some kind of wealthy people, I think, that got arrested or famous people. And the sentence for them was very light. <laughs> and then um, there was, yeah, there were some interesting cases. So try to think of some cases in your country where the judge was biased in favor of the privileged. Um, it might also be just not just money, it's that the judge is a certain ethnicity and will make judgments that are biased against people from a different ethnicity um, or race or gender. Um, so, so I want to quit at that point and um, have you meet in groups for, for a while. Hopefully, each of you can come up with examples. So I'm going to let somebody in the group um let's see where am i share screen somebody in the group can share that screen and you just go through those five different political virtues and everybody goes around and gives an example of a good law or bad law based on whether it promotes a strong and stable middle class um all right Let's see, let me put you in groups here. Um, and I'll put you in, I'm gonna move somebody from group one to group two. So be prepared. Oh, Nahida assigned to group two. Component two, okay. All right, so um, I wanted to point out that just recently, oh, here's the rest of this outline, is that practical wisdom is knowing how to make a decision in a particular situation. So principles and laws apply universally, but if you're practically wise, you, you, can, you do a good job of taking that principle and applying it to specifics. Um, that's the art of deliberation. You can figure out what the real options are. What, what are our real choices? Not these ultimate uh, utopian pie in the sky or something, just something concrete 
and which one of those choices is best and why. And then they can go persuade other people to uh, follow along, to do the same thing. Um, uh, okay, the wisest choice is people who have a reputation over time for making good decisions. And that um, is actually, that's what tragedy is trying to give people examples. Here's an example of when somebody made the wrong decision. Here's an example of when somebody made a good decision. And so the tragedies and the poetry present particular situations. So they're getting people in the habit of thinking about particulars and then thinking about patterns and things to do and not to do in those types of situations. Um, all right, there's, then there's a difference between the causes underneath the natural world and the things that are impossible or possible. There's a lot of order in the natural world, but the realm of human choice is a lot more variable and a lot more difficult to predict because people do crazy things. And so that's why the arts are trying, in spite of all the craziness of human choice, artists are trying to find patterns to try and educate people about how to make the best choices in a particular situation. Um, okay, a just character, um, fate, destiny. So, um, so I'll probably go over this again. Uh, later on. I mean, we're going to keep referring to these virtues throughout the class. But one thing I did want to point out is that right at the end, uh, recently, a couple hours ago, I posted three different news articles. And the first one is uh, about how many Americans think that God is involved, God's hand is involved in presidential elections. So I don't know how many of you in other countries think that's true in the US, what you know about the US. Um, I think, I, I mean, our founding fathers would be very upset about that because they did want to separate church and state. And that's why they had that educational system with Greek and Latin, because those are pagans, right? And so if you learn these classical virtues, which literally were given to us by pagans, you can understand that virtue doesn't belong to any one uh, Christian denomination, and you can separate out. I mean, you can say at my church, I learn a lot of these virtues, but when you're in public life, you exercise your mind based on your character, but you don't bring in God. Okay, so, um, so our country has become a lot more conservative about that. Anyway, so that's one, um, one point. And then another article, you can think about, those of you not in the US can think about um, how people in your country, do they think of elections as God is somewhat involved or not. Then in, in my country, and again, this might be true in your countries, um, that educated people will have a prejudice against less educated people. And that also is a prejudice prejudging, and it just creates more polarization. So again, that's why you have this classical model of practical wisdom. A practically wise person is not going to polarize or demonize. They want to make a middle class. And so they're going to have empathy with everyone. The tragedies and the poetry show you that, geez, I have empathy with that woman who kills her kids to get back at her husband. Like it sounds awful. But if you look at the story and you follow the storyline, you can go, oh my gosh, I, I understand why we sh she's so mad. And so um, the traditional liberal, liberal arts education tried to develop empathy 
that you, you identify with all the other people in their different class, race, ethnicity, gender, and, um, and then you can govern. You can't govern unless you really can understand and have empathy and respect for each other. Now, the last one is about one of the cabinets. We have a national department of education. And um, so I want you to speculate. First of all, who would you want? What sort of background would you want in a person who's in charge of national public health uh, education? Would you want someone who is rich, poor, or middle class, right? Would you want someone who went to public school or someone who went to private school? And would you want someone who went to a secular private school or a religious private school? Well, it seems like somebody who went to a religious school wouldn't have very good understanding of public education. That seems to me you wouldn't want someone who went to all religious schools. Then if you, um, it seems like somebody who's really rich and went to private schools would be very isolated, right? What would they, you know, they wouldn't understand. So it seems to me it would be someone who was poor or middle class, went to public school, and was able to pull themselves up into their position because of their public education that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten. And they're a, a great defender of public education. It just seems like that would be the kind of character you would want. Well, um, this particular person uh, that was appointed, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who appointed the person. It, it was a, she was, a billionaire. She contributed to political campaign for the people who gave her the power. She spent her life in conservative Christian private schools. And she did things like using the pandemic to strip funding from public schools. Okay, so I do think, you know, because we're talking about education that that matters. And I don't, again, I'm not gonna super politicize everything, but this was just education. This is where an educated populace should look at who the elected candidates, who they appoint to positions. Do they appoint people that contributed to their campaigns but are unqualified? or basically whose judgment is corrupted in their ability to make good decisions about public life? Or do they choose people who have a CV, who have a lot of experience, personal experience, personal commitment, and also a good education, and they've always used their education to promote a middle class, they could make more money, but they wanna do public life. So I do think educated voters should be a, should think also about who, when I vote, I vote on the basis of who this person is going to appoint as the head of Department of Education, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, Department of the Secretary of State, you know, all those cabinet positions. And so that's how I vote. Um, but that's hardly ever mentioned in the news. And I can't even, I'm trying to find a book that just gives you, gives Americans or gives me as a, a lecturer, a history of who the president has appointed to these cabinet positions ever since 1980, just so, so that we get a sense of what's going on. Um, and that, so, so that's very important, I think, in terms of, um, educated voter. And, and the media doesn't cover that. It's not that it covers it in a corrupt way, it's just not mentioned very much. So I don't like to say, you know, media is biased, blah, blah. It's mostly the subject matter. What do they focus on? 
What don't they focus on? So that's a whole nother issue. But anyway, it's 1040. Uh, papers are coming due. And I am available for uh, paper conferences. And I think that I will make another short video about the papers because in my other class, we spent class time talking about the papers. So I will make a 15 minute video or so if you want additional conversation about the paper. And then I have my office hours. So, okay, take care. I will stay here if students have a question, but it's time for you to go.